holy, holy is the Lord. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Well, I see, I know that you guys had to see today that, uh, that I did not have any notes. For, well, I have some notes for you, but I don't have any blanks for you to fill in, right? I know that messed some of you guys up because you didn't have, you don't have any blanks to fill in. Um, I, I did give you some notes, uh, about three quarters of a page, uh, because I wanted you to have this to take home in case you might want to look at some other things in connection with it. You would at least have an idea of what I'm talking about, <laughs> all right? And um, I don't think it's going to be so muddled up that you won't be able to understand what I'm talking about. But what I'm talking about is, is, a, is a tremendous, uh, gigantic concept, and, and it's a truth, it's a reality in the New Testament. And we, I touched on it just a tad last week in one of the points out of, uh, you remember we were on David and Goliath on the series The Edge, and we were talking last week about uh, how God gives us the advantage and that's one of the edge that edges that God gives us against our enemy is that is that uh, that He gives us an advantage. And one of the points was that it is a sin to simply survive okay. what God has called us to conquer. Yeah. And you might remember the passage when David uh, knocked Goliath down with the sling. And then David runs to the giant and takes the giant's own sword, pulls it out, and cuts the giant's head off. And we talked about, or I talked about how brutal that was, and, you know, that's kind of, you know, it, things like that <laughs> make you wonder why, why we make this a children's story, you know? I mean, it, it's very, very brutal and, and you know, and tough. And, and so the question was, why did he do that? I mean, Goliath was dead. The rock sank into his forehead. And he was gone uh, from the time that rock hit him. He was, he was out of here. But David wasn't satisfied with that because the custom of the day was that to completely vanquish your enemy, to completely annihilate them and to, and to prove that they are out of business and will never be back, the custom was to cut their head off. And that meant Goliath is now separated forever and he will never be back. And so um, I talked to you about how as children of God that many of us find ourselves uh, accepting uh, survival as a Christian as if that's normal for a child of God. I mean, uh, like the soldiers that went up to the battlefield every day for 39 days before the last day when David showed up. All 39 days, all of those, all those soldiers went to the battle lines and stood there and looked down and, and saw the Philistines on their battle lines and saw Goliath walk out in front and raise his hands and challenge the armies of God and insult God's integrity and insult them and belittle them. And they just stood there on that mountainside, breathing hard probably, sweating a little bit, and thinking to themselves... Man, I hope I can get through this day. Woo! I hope I live to tell my kids about this. Woo hoo hoo! Hey, and then when they saw Goliath turn around and go, You bunch of cowards! And he turns around and walks back to his army lines, their hearts go, Woo! Man, thank God. Whew. Let's go back to the tent. Thankful to be alive. Thankful to have simply survived. Another day. This was a great day because, thank God, I didn't die at the hands of Goliath today. As if that's the goal of the Christian life. And it's very hard, for, very easy for us as New Testament Christians to fall into the same kind of um, thought patterns. Uh, to, to think of the Christian life as, uh, well, I called it last week, fire insurance. Uh, you want fire insurance. Why, why did you come to the Lord? Why do, you, why do you want Jesus in your heart? Why do you, why do you come to church? Why do you pray? Why, why do you do this? Well, I want to go to heaven when I die. Well, is that it? I mean, is that all you want? Now, I, I, I'm not making light of heaven. I mean, you know that. I'm not, I mean, I love heaven. I, I'm going to heaven when I die, and I'm looking forward to it one day. <laughs> I'm not getting a load up today, but I, I will be looking forward to it one day. And it's going to be a great and wonderful place. It's a land of, 
of blessing. And I mean, there's nothing negative at all about heaven. But that's like someday. But there are three tenses of salvation, and I'll just run it back by you in case you are a theologian or something and you really like this kind of stuff. There are three tenses of salvation. There is the past tense of salvation, which means that sometime in the past, I have given my heart to Christ. And Jesus' blood has washed my sin, and I have now become clean by the blood of the Lamb. Isaiah said, come, 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 let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. How do your sins get white as snow? By the blood of the Lamb. The blood Jesus shed on the cross is the blood that cleanses the sin from our life. It's miraculous. That's right. And, and I was made, when I did that in, it might have been a week ago, a day ago, a year ago, 50 years ago. Whenever I did it, it made me just as if I'd never sinned. I have been justified. One of these days, I'm going to be glorified because one of these days, I'm going to leave this earth and I'm going to go to heaven and I'm going to step into the glory of God and that God's going to welcome me in. Jesus said, uh, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it wasn't so, I would have told you that it wasn't so. And I go to prepare a place for you. And where I go, I will come back and receive you that where I am, there you might be also. And the way you know, and Thomas said, I don't know the way. And Jesus said, uh, it was on the ver up on the screen a few moments ago. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Not some other way. <laughs> <laughs> not some magical plan, not some prophetic voice, not some weird wanderings in some, in some cultic uh, activity or whatever. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the life. The one and only is literally what he's saying. And no man, unless you think Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about, uh, I believe he does know what he's talking about. And he said, and, and so I will be glorified. I was justified, and I will be glorified. Yeah. Uh, but what about the nasty now and now? Well, in the nasty now and now, <laughs> there's a process of salvation that is called sanctification. To sanctify something means to set it aside, to set it apart. So from the time... I am justified until the time I am glorified. I'm on this earth walking through life in a process called sanctification. Now, in case you wonder what the purpose of sanctification is, in Romans 8, 28, one of our favorite verses, I'm sure that you quoted it many times, for we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. How many times have you said that? Many times when bad stuff happens, you say, whoo, thank God I know that this, God's going to take this and somehow work it with some other stuff, and it's going to be good. I mean, individual things might not be good, but when God works them together, all things work together for the good of those that love God and call according to his purpose. Have you ever quoted the next verse? Verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, them he also did predestine. Only predestination talked about in the Bible, by the way. No other predestination except this one single thing. Once you come to Christ, he said, you are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. For whom he did foreknow them, he did also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So what is sanctification? Sanctification is God making you look like Jesus. And all through your life, you're going through the process of God working in you to create as close a replica as possible to Jesus Christ. Now, we all know we'll never arrive at Jesus, this side of glory. But that doesn't mean we don't work that way. I mean, I may never become everything, but I... I I want, to be, I, want, I want to be closer than I am now to that, you know? Yeah, right, the grind. 
Yeah. And so all of my life, God is working. And, and that's what this is about. This is, that's, what, that's what the life that Christ has called us to live is all about. That's what the church is all about. In the New Testament, it's called the kingdom of God. Now, this is, this is amazing that, that people really don't pay very close attention to this. It's the reality of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. What that simply means is God has a kingdom. And in this kingdom, uh, he rules this kingdom. The order that it operates in is decided by God. And uh, the government of this kingdom, how it functions and what its tenets are, are all ordained by God. This is not like we're all independent contractors. Once we give our heart to Christ, we're all into, into independent contractors and, and we all go our individual ways. The kingdom produces a life like the life that Jesus led. Jesus wasn't an independent contractor here on this earth. Do you, do, you, do you know this? Most people think, you know what Jesus did? Jesus is God's son. Jesus you know, came from heaven, was born in a, in a Bethlehem manger, and then he grew up, and he became a man, and he, and, he, and he chose some disciples, and he taught those disciples for three years, and he went all over the country doing good and miracles and performing wonders and, do, and teaching people and speaking to people, and then the, the Jewish religion hated him and captured him and put him on a cross and killed him, and then he uh, gave up himself, and then uh, he went and was in a tomb, and then three days later he rose again, then he went to heaven, and then sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat, and God saved people because of that. And you would be wrong. Because Jesus didn't come to this earth as an independent contractor. Even though he's God. Jesus is God. <laughs> we call him the Son of God, but the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I don't explain, don't ask me to explain that mystery of the Trinity, but the fact is they're all one. We have one God, and yet there are three representatives of him: the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus comes to this earth. You know what Jesus said when he was here on this earth? They were saying things to him like, perform us a miracle, do us a wonder, dance a little jig, Jesus. What Jesus said? He said, I don't do anything that I don't see my father doing. In other words, everything I do on this earth is because I saw my father do it in heaven. And I don't say anything that I haven't heard my father say in heaven. So to produce a life like Jesus lived, it takes the kingdom of God. Jesus preached about the kingdom. Now, uh, this is something that'll get by you if you're not real careful. Uh, that's all Jesus did preach, as a matter of fact. 101 times in the book uh, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. 101 times Jesus teaches on the kingdom of God. Uh, let me just give you a few little notable times that you'll, you'll see. And these are just out of Matthew. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And, of course, the Beatitudes, the very first one is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. And then later on in the Beatitudes, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In this manner, when he taught his disciples how to pray, they came to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray and Jesus said, all right, in this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Yeah, yeah. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then down at the end, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And who could forget verse 33 of Matthew 6. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things will be added to you. Clearly, the plan and the purpose of God 
is, gives us a revolutionary new life. A life that doesn't simply get by. A life that doesn't just simply uh, wait for a future day in order to become something on, the, on this earth. A revolutionary life that is free from the obsession of yourself. That is free from sin and shame and sorrow and guilt and condemnation. He, a life that Jesus says in John 10, 10 uh, is life abundantly. Yeah. You remember the thief comes to steal, to kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. A wonderful life, a great life, a challenging life. It's the word, the, the word translated life there is the word zoe. And it just means the life and animation and vitality of God. Yeah, Jesus said, you know what I came to give you? I came to give you a life that is filled with the spizzerinkum of God. <laughs> that is filled with the enthusiasm of God, the encouragement of God, and the animation so that you can, you, can, you can be like that. You can move like that. You can walk like that. You can be better than you are. You can move towards something great. The life and the animation and the vitality of God, that's what the kingdom is all about, and that's what Jesus taught about. Now, the temptation and the plan of the enemy is to lure the church to a settled-for life or a settled-for salvation where, where we believe certain things and then we have an experience and then we claim uh, eternal life as if that's as far as it goes. We're encouraged by an enemy of our soul to to make it an experience that we're seeking after. Mm -hmm. So our focus becomes, did you believe the right doctrine? Or did, did you say the right words? Are you sure you said all the words right and in the right order and you, you, you said everything you needed? Did you ask God to forgive you of your sins or did you just ask him to come into your heart? As if it really matters which one of those you said. Or, 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 or have you had the, the right experience? Have you spoken in tongues? Have you turned backflips across the altar? Have you flown through the air on a flying trapeze? That's the temptation of the enemy to, to wreck what Jesus said our life is, so, is to be about. And the enemy tries to say, you need all of this so you can go to heaven when you die. As if God saved you only for the fact that he wants you to come to heaven one day. So our focus becomes on a life that is lived here on earth, a settled for life. But what, yeah, but, yeah, <laughs> but what happens is when we believe that, when we settle for that, it doesn't significantly change the way we live. So as a result of that, we have pulled out of the mainstream of life. Don't tell me, as Christians, one of the major issues that are happening in our world today, especially in our nation, is that we have decided that we need to pull out of the mainstream of life. That this is church and that's politics. This is church and that's business. This is church and that's real family life out there. As if somehow we have abdicated what God has called us to, to, uh, to improve and to march in and to be a part of uh, to somebody who seemingly uh, has more of a, of, a, of, a, of a plan for it than we have. We've said to the world, you can have the education system. You can have the marketplace. You can have the politics. You can have the science. You can have the medical field. You can have all that stuff because you know why? We're going to heaven when we die. And brother, they've taken it. And look at what they're doing with it. I mean, my Lord, just in the medical field alone, 
We've had states in this country that are killing babies that have already been born. And thinking that's okay. It's a mama's choice. My Lord, folks. This, this is not what the kingdom is about. The kingdom of God, which Jesus preached constantly, consistently, throughout the entire New Testament, every time he opened his mouth, he was saying, the kingdom of heaven is this, the kingdom of God is that, identifying the fact that we were not just a part of a little small group huddled up on earth trying to wade out all of the work of the devil so somehow we could get raptured one day or go to heaven when we die. There is a consummation of the age. There is a heaven to look forward to. But that's not all life is for us here on this earth, according to what Jesus said. Let me, as a matter of fact, let me just, I want to just show you. Let me just show you. Now, this is just in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, like I said, 101 times, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Jesus talked about the kingdom. Let me just take one chapter, Matthew 13. Have you ever read Matthew 13? I know some of you have. You know what Matthew 13 is? It's a chapter full of teaching on the kingdom. Let me just show you. I'm just going to, I'm, now I'm taking a chance on this that you'll, that you'll hang with me on this. Let me see here if I can get, get it going. All right. All right, here we go. First verse, on the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea and great multitudes were gathered together to him and he got into a boat and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore and he spoke many things to them in parables saying, behold, a sower went out to sow and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Let him who has ears to hear Hear what the Spirit says. In other words, Jesus is saying to us, you know what the kingdom is like? The kingdom is like a sower that goes forth and he sows seed out into this world. And this seed is the precious teaching, understanding, and, 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 and challenge of the kingdom of God. And, and, and some people uh, won't even hear it at all. They won't even listen to what you're talking about with a kingdom. They're just too uh, hard. And, and the enemy comes and just takes the seed that you said and, and, and eats it off. And then some, uh, you know, they, when they hear it, they say, My Lord, the kingdom of God. Oh, great. Ooh, boy, I'm going to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. And for about two or three weeks, boy, they are fired up about the kingdom of God. Their life's going to change. Their whole world's going to change. They're going to be with it. And they are pumped about it. But all of a sudden, you know, because, uh, you know, they got a new boyfriend or they got a new girlfriend or they got a new business or they had to work on Sunday or whatever, now... They just filter away. They don't have any root. They don't have any depth. And that word of the kingdom just dies right there. And then some receive the word gladly and say, man, I'm glad God's got a kingdom and I want to be a part of it. And I need my life to change and I want to be changed by the kingdom of God. I want to be like Jesus. And then all of a sudden, the cares of this world chokes it, thorns, finances, children, community, school, uh, work, whatever. Just chokes that, that thought right out of them. And then some, it grows in and produces a hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold. You, you, you are a hundredfold return on seed that has been sown by the shepherd about life and the kingdom of God. But he doesn't stop there. Look at this. 
And the disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. In other words, you have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is going to help you understand the kingdom, but they don't have the Holy Spirit, and they're not going to understand the kingdom because it's too complicated to understand, so I have to do it in a parable, so maybe they'll understand what I'm talking about. For whoever has, now watch this. For whoever has, now I know you've heard these verses preached by the merchants of merchandise and these, uh, and these, and these, uh, these uh, name it and claim it boys and, and all of that. To t and, 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 and what they'll tell you that verse means is that, you know, uh, those of you that have everything, God's going to give more because you somehow believe more and you're better and you don't sin, whatever it might be. But look at what this verse, this verse is talking about receiving the seed of the kingdom. And notice what it says, for whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to him in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In other words... When you hear the message of the kingdom of God, the more you can receive of it, the more is given to you. You say, man, I've never heard about the kingdom. What about this kingdom? And living in a kingdom, I mean, what is that? All? Uh, Pastor, is this some new cult that you're starting? Or is this some new you know, program? No, 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 no. This is what Jesus came to give us. This is what we have... Uh, usurped in, in, in the Christian life, in church life. We've accepted a counterfeit. And Jesus said, if you, if you hear this and you will receive this and, and, you can, and you can understand some of this, then God's going to give you the ability to understand more. But, if, but, but those of you that don't understand and you've closed your mind off and you don't want to understand, even that little bit of understanding you thought you had, you're not going to have anymore. Because you can't see and you can't hear. You thought you could, but look at what he said. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, this, Isaiah said this like uh, 3,000 years ago, hearing uh, you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive for, their heart, for the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly, I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So you have been welcomed now, Jesus said, into hearing and seeing something that men of old only heard about by faith and by, and by God's word prophetically speaking to them, and now we are living in it. And he said, you are blessed to live in it. Now, he's going to go ahead and explain this parable of the sower. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower when anyone hears the word of the kingdom. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, not the word of Walmart or the word of uh, the newest movement or the claim it and the say it and the gab it and the grab it and the speak it and the say it. What is this about? This is about the kingdom. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, all fired up about it, excited about it. It's going to make a difference. Yet he has no root in himself, but he endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who received the seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirty. 
Another parable he put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Then how does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us to gather them up? Uh, do, you, do you want us to then to go and, and gather them up? But he said, No, no, no. Lest while you gather up the tares, you might also uproot some of the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at, that, at the time of the harvest, I'll say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, that'll be explained in just a minute, but I just, these are just, this is just the chapter, right? Verse, verse by verse. Look at this. Next verse. Another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but it is grown. But when it's grown, it's greater than the, herb, than the herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a field that you sow in. The kingdom of heaven is like a man that went forth sowing good seed. Jesus is telling, what is he doing? He's telling us what the kingdom of heaven is. And what is intention? It starts out tiny like a mustard seed, but it grows into a big tree that covers enough space for birds to come and land in its branches. The kingdom of God does not decrease, it increases. The kingdom of God doesn't go away. It becomes a, a, a resting place. It fills the earth. Another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it leavened all. Look, leaven is, uh, is yeast, right? Yeast is alive, right? You guys know this? Yeah, you do. Yeast is alive. You take a little bit of yeast and you put it in a bunch of dough. What's going to happen to the dough? It's all going to get leavened. It's not just going to get a little bit leaven. It's all going to get leaven because yeast is pervasive, right? The kingdom of God is pervasive. The kingdom of God influences everything it touches. The kingdom of God does not shrink away and say, educate them any way you want to. We don't have an opinion because we're going to heaven when we die. Do anything you want to to us. Take away our rights. Do anything because we're going to heaven when we die. That's not the kingdom of God. All of these Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables and without a parable he did not speak to them that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying I'll open my mouth in parables. I'll utter things kept secret from the foundations of the world. Now here comes the parable of the tares because I know everybody thinks they know what the parable of the tares is all about. I know what you're probably thinking. All right, you know, here's what the parable of the tares is. The parable of the tares means that in every church, there's some people that are really Christians and there are other people that just look like they're Christians, but they're not really Christians. And you would be wrong. That, bird, that parable is not about the church. You're about to see it. I, I, I prove it right here, one, probably on the first line. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and he went into the house and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and he said to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. So when you see him going out in the field and sowing the good, you know, the, the farmer sows the good seed, that's Jesus sowing good seed. Uh, and uh, uh, the, look at verse 38. The field is the church. Uh, wait a minute. Doesn't say that? Yeah, sure. Well, that's what everybody teaches. This is talking about the church where people sitting in there look like, look like Christians, but they're tear. And people even say, look at that tear sitting beside you. No. Jesus said the field is not the church. The field is the world. This is not talking about the church. It's talking about the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, 
The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. What this is saying is, look, the mystery of God in this world is that good and evil grow together. Not in the church, in the world. In the world, there are tares and there is wheat. And these grow in the same field together, side by side, amongst each other. And the servants ask the master, do you want us to go out there and pull up those nasty tares? And the master, to everybody's surprise, said, no. No. Jesus, you don't don't want us to get rid of the wicked people in the world? You don't want us to kill the evil people in the world, Jesus? Get rid of those tares out there for you? He said, no, because when you're trying to kill one of those tares, you might hurt the wheat. Because you don't know the difference between a tare and a wheat. Some things you call a tear are wheat, and some things you call wheat are a tear. When have you ever said before, that is, this is killing me. I'm, a, I'm dying from this. Oh, I can't take it anymore. Oh, it's terrible in my life. And then, and then uh, three or four years later, uh, when that little thing's bouncing around, uh, around your feet down there, you say, you're the cutest thing I've ever seen in my life. Oh, come here today. You know, Something you thought was the most evil thing in the world about, about three years ago now has become the greatest thing in the world. The mystery of God is that good and evil can grow together. And he said, let it keep growing. I have to assume by that 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 means Jesus is saying bad stuff in this world is good for us. It helps us. It blesses us in some way. In other words, if there's nothing to overcome, how will we ever learn how to be overcomers? Right, if there's no enemy to sharpen our skills against, what kind of battles can we win? Jesus said, let them both grow together, and when it comes time at the end, I'm going to send the harvesters in because the harvesters know the difference between a tear and a wheat. And that's why stuff's not going to be judged until the end of everything. Because it's not over to the end. That influence that you have right now when you die, it's not over. No, it's not over. Those people you talk to, those children you led, those grandchildren you, that watched you grow up and, and wanted to be like you and they love you and they imitate you and they mock you and they, they want to be everything that they could be like you. When you die and they keep on living like that, that's either going to bring them closer to God or further away from God. And in the judgment, it's going to show up because we're not dead until the end. Our influence lives on forever until Jesus comes and settles everything out. And Jesus says, at the end, I'm going to send the angels and we're going to take everything out that's not part of the kingdom. And I'll cast them into the furnace of fire, and they'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who has ears to hear. Let him hear. Are y'all all right? Can I do one more or so? I know I'm, 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 I'm yelling at you like I'm mad, but I'm not mad at you. It's those people on the Internet make me mad. That's who we after. Again, I mean, do you see this? One right after another. The kingdom of heaven is like. 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 Here, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. The kingdom is so valuable that, that everything you have in life should be surrendered so that the kingdom can be received in your life. It is, it is beyond value. And here comes another one that's going to tell you real quick. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. That's the kingdom. 
The kingdom is so valuable, it's so unique, it's so powerful that we should surrender everything in order to have the kingdom. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew it to the shore and they sat down and they gathered the good into the vessels, but they threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from the, from the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire, and they'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, now look, Jesus said to them, have you understood all things? And they said, yes, Lord. All right, I'm saying that because the next thing he says is based on them just telling him he, they have understood everything he said. Have you understood everything I said? Uh, yes, sir. Now, I don't know whether they had or not, but he lowers the boom on them right here in this next one. Then he said to them, now, this, is, this doesn't begin with the kingdom of heaven is like. It's the only one that doesn't begin with that simile. It doesn't say the kingdom of heaven is like, but notice what he says to them. He said, then he said to them, okay, you just told me you understood, right? Everything I will just say it. So he said to them, therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. That's the kingdom. Did you get it? You didn't get it? You all didn't get it? Okay. All right. Let me just hit it real quick. He says, every scribe. What is a scribe? A scribe is somebody who, who, who transfers uh, notes from one book to another. In the, old, in the Bible days, they had to do it by hand. And they just they looked at this book and they just copied into another manuscript. But by this time, a, a scribe was much more than that. Ezra is the prototype of a scribe uh, because Ezra was a, was a man of the book. And so scribes by this time had become um, studies of uh, they had become like pastors. They had become uh, like students of the Word, and they had learned everything they could about this Word that they're transcribing so that if any questions came up, they could answer it. So he says, all right, to you guys that have studied this Word so deeply and have prepared, and you're ready to train others, you, you can teach them. So he's, now he's talking to pastors and teachers and preachers, which these disciples who just said they understood all that stuff about the kingdom, are going to become. And he says, here's what you're going to have to know and do. So every scribe instructed comes from the same word as disciple comes from. So he's talking about somebody who has been instructed. So here's a person who now is an instructor themselves, but they have been mentored by somebody else. Concerning the kingdom of heaven. So you've been taught things about the kingdom of heaven and you're ready to share the kingdom of heaven with other people. You are ready to preach the kingdom of heaven. You are like a householder. A householder is the king of the house. A householder is the master of the house. A householder is the authority of the house. So he says, you are going to walk with authority given to you. I, I know people don't want to treat pastors or leaders or, 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 or spiritual teachers like they have any authority in life. But Jesus said, you do, and, you, and, and not only do you have authority, you have the responsibility that goes with that authority. And what your job is, is your job is to learn everything from, from the one that mentors you and then be able to teach the, the, the mysteries of the kingdom so that everybody can hear it. And you're like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Uh, treasure means your treasury, your, 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 your storeroom that holds all of the treasured things you have in life. As an example... Uh, in this day, it would probably be food because they didn't have, you know, uh, Walmart and they didn't have Food Giant and they didn't have Winn-Dixie. They didn't have that. So they had to have a storeroom full of food or else they would die. That was a treasure. And they kept food in there that was old and new. So it was the, it was the job of the householder, the authority of the house, it was his job to go into that treasure room and pick out stuff, some old and some new, because if you just eat the old stuff, you're never going to enjoy the flavor of anything that is fresh and new. 
and it's going to become bland and old and yucky. But if you only eat the new stuff, then the old stuff is going to get cankered and moldy and you're going to lose it. So the job of a hus- the job of a disciple, a teacher, an instructor, and with the word of the kingdom is to go into the treasured place like the word of God and, and, and bring out the old stuff and blend in it the new stuff so that they get a new light on old things so that their life can be blessed. And he says, so you said you understood. Let's go. Listen, I'm going to give you a parable. Let me give you a parable. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a huge mansion that God gives every one of us. You get a mansion. You get a mansion. You get a mansion. You get a mansion. You get, and you get a mansion. Everybody gets a mansion. And then you go home and you walk upstairs to a tiny closet and you set up residence in the closet. Hey, good parable. No, God does not intend for you to live in a closet. God gave you a gigantic mansion. The rooms are big. They're well lit. They have lots of entertaining features in them. They have a lot of amenities in them. They are wonderful. They are nice and pleasant and good. And, and, and you have gone up and got in a closet and shut the door and started trying to redecorate the closet so it can look like something. You, and griping and fussing and complaining all the time because I thought the Christian life was bigger than this. I thought God was better than this. I thought life would be better. I thought things would be good. In the kingdom. It is. Get out of the closet. Get out of the closet and get in the house that God has given you to live. The, the kingdom of God is the house where the, where the work of God and the purpose of God can be done and the kingdom is available to you now. You know what Jesus said a lot of times? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means it's available. You can walk right into it right now. But you know what keeps us from walking in? We've accepted the counterfeit. The counterfeit to the kingdom of God is religion. And the enemy has fed it to us and fed it to us until now. We're not seeking the kingdom because we don't even know it exists. Because we have swallowed the counterfeit, the religion of this world, the, the tapestry, the majesty, the, the, the muck and the mire, the, uh, the showmanship, the uh, ceremonies, the celebrations, the holidays, the festivals, uh, we've accepted that as the real and we're not even looking for the real anymore because we've eaten the counterfeit. In order to get to the real, you have to reject the counterfeit. There is one group of people in, in the New Testament that most typifies super religion. And they are a super religious bunch that hounded Jesus every step and literally became the harbingers of Jesus' crucifixion. They're called the Pharisees. John 9, that I plan to start next week, <laughs> is about you might be a Pharisee. Because I guarantee you that many of us are, are more kin to the Pharisees than we are to Christ by our attitudes, our actions, our motives, and our way we do things. And only a little bit of light shine on it will help us to see what's the difference. Because God wants you to have life and have it abundantly, not to be trapped in some closet pretending that it's, fun. Come to the kingdom. Won't you, would you stand your feet with me one second, would you?